Hi, I'm Chuck Fisher, and you may remember me from such scientific training films as DNA, friend or foe, that's for the judge to decide, and how to make a small nuclear device out of common household items. Today, we'll be learning about liquid chromatography, mass spectroscopy, or LCMS, here at Marywood University. So what is LCMS? Well, let's go find out. Let's take some time to look at the theory behind LCMS. LCMS is made up of two parts, high performance liquid chromatography, or HPLC, and mass spectroscopy, or MS. By themselves, HPLC and MS are two very powerful scientific instruments, but when combined together in the form of LCMS, one gets one very powerful scientific tool. We're going to look at HPLC and MS by themselves, and we're going to see what happens when they're combined together. And we're going to do so using our magic whiteboard of science. <laughs> the first purpose of HPLC is to separate different compounds within a mixture. These compounds can be separated on various chemical and physical properties, such as size, charge, and affinity to other molecules. With any form of chromatography, mixtures are being separated into their component parts. It just depends on how it's being done. You could use paper and paper chromatography, gas for gas chromatography, or in our case, we're using liquids for liquid chromatography. With any form of chromatography, there are two parts, the stationary phase and the mobile phase. The mobile phase is the mixture that contains the analytes that you wish to study. The mobile phase travels through the stationary phase where it's separated. The stationary phase contains some sort of compound or compounds which retard the movement of, the of different components of the mobile phase through it. The, mobile the stationary phase can be made of silica gel, cephadex, some sort of retardant, some sort of inhibitor, which allows the compounds to be separated. So as we can see here, our compound in our mobile phase went through, the, went through our chromatography column in three parts, the black, the red, and the blue. But within the column, they became separated, with the black eluding first, the red eluding second, and the blue eluding third. All of the compounds, all of the analytes, come through our chromatography column, but they come through at different rates. And since they come out of the column at different times, they can be separated and analyzed individually. For HPLC, we use this form of chromatography column. It's a long column, silica packed, that the analyte travels through. Now different projects are going to require different sorts of columns. This here is a much longer column. Compounds going through it, the mobile phase going through it, is going to have more time to separate. So as it's being analyzed, it will not only take longer, but it will give a more clear indication of which chemicals are eluding at different times. This is something what you would use if you had compounds that are very similar to each other and elute near the same time with a smaller column. This will give them more time to elute and it'll give you a better idea of what's coming out of the column since there's more time. Now chromatography columns can vary in size. This is a much smaller column. This here is much more akin to what we're using on the different projects here at Marywood. It has a much shorter column length, so compounds coming through it separate much more, separate much more quickly, and, but they can elute near the same time, which can make it more difficult. It depends largely on what you're doing. It will determine what sort of chromatography column and what sort of chromatography techniques you'll be using. Okay. So, we've separated our different component analytes from our mixture, but these analytes are really, really small. How do we know what's been separated? Well, this is where the analysis part comes in. We'll now discuss the analysis of the different components coming through the chromatography columns. Once our analytes have separated, the first thing they enter is something called the PDA, or photodiode array, which I now have in my hands. This is an example of a photodiode array here. 
the analytes enter through one tube and exit through the other tube on their way to the mass spec. If you look really carefully here, there's a little window. Through this window, light shines in to the different compounds. And this light is generated by a tungsten lamp or a deuterium lamp. And it scans different wavelengths. I think I'm going to get rid of this now so I can continue on with the demonstration. Boy, I'm getting pretty good at this. Anyway, as the compounds enter the PDA, the light is shown through them. Now this whole process, this analytical process, is called spectrophotometry. In spectrophotometry, we're looking for absorbances of the different compounds. We're looking for where the compounds will absorb light. So anyway, a graph is generated on the main PDA, on the main screen, from showing different parts of the visible and ultraviolet spectrum. So for in this, in this instance, we're looking at an area between 200 nanometers and 600 nanometers. That's the lambda, the wavelength, across the x-axis. And on the y-axis, we look at the absorbance. Each compound has its own unique absorbance, its own unique part of the electromagnetic spectrum where it will absorb. Using that information, you can determine its lambda max. And the lambda max is where its maximum, its point of maximum absorbance. So in this instance, in this case, our compound has an absorbance around, let's say, 400 nanometers. So 400 nanometers is the unique absorbance for this particular compound. The other part of the PDA, the other part of the display you'll be looking at, will show the absorbance over time. The absorbance over time shows you when the compounds are eluding out of the tube. So you can determine information about the compounds by the time they elute, depending on your method file, which is something else we'll talk about later, and their particular lambda max. So using this information, we can get an idea of what is coming out of the tube, what compounds, what analytes we're looking at. Now HPLC is a powerful tool, and we can use it to determine a lot about different compounds. But the fact is, if you're running many unknown compounds through your system, you may not be able to identify them. And so, if you take HPLC and you combine it with something else, mass spectroscopy, you can identify unknown compounds. Let's talk about that next. After being analyzed in the PDA, the analyte travels through the tubing to the mass spectrometer. In the mass spectrometer, the first thing that they interact with is the ESI, or the electrospray ionizer. The electrospray ionizer uses a nebulizing gas, which is usually nitrogen, to nebulize the analyte, or create a fine mist. In the process of creating this fine mist, the analyte becomes ionized with either a positive or a negative charge. Once our analyte has been ionized, it then enters into the quadrupole. The quadrupole is made up of four charged rods. These rods change their charge thousands of times a second. <laughs> alternating between positive and negative charges. As the analyte enters the quadrupole, the charge deflects it. Most of the time, around 99% of the time, most of the analyte that enters the quadrupole, because of its charge, smacks right into it. And when that happens, the analyte is trapped. It's not destroyed, it's just permanently entombed, stuck, glued to, never coming off again, the quadrupole. This analyte will no longer be analyzed. However, some of the analyte will be able to survive the trip through the quadrupole and hit the detector. At the exact moment that the analyte hits the detector, the detector will record what the quadrupole, what the charge of the quadrupoles were at at the moment the analyte hit the detector. By determining the charge that the quadrupoles were at at the time of hit, one can elucidate the mass of the analyte. Why to understand is that? that, let's look at this generically light molecule and this generically heavy molecule. A light molecule does not take a lot of energy to deflect it. 
in terms of charge. Whereas a heavy molecule will take much more energy because it's heavier. Simple inertia, simple physics. Light things can be moved quickly. Heavy things, slowly, because more mass. Works equals mass times acceleration. So, anyway, if we have a light molecule traveling down the detector, when it registers a hit, the detector is going to look back at the quadrupole and see what the charge was. If the charge was light, if it was a minimal charge, a minimal shift in charge, that would have indicated that it would have had to have been a light molecule. Because if it was a higher charge, the lighter molecule would have smacked into the quadrupole, been destroyed, and we would have never seen it again. However, if a heavier molecule hits the detector, the detector is going to look back at the quadrupoles. The quadrupoles will have registered a higher charge. That means that it must have been a higher mass molecule to make it to the end of the detector because it would have taken so much more energy for this higher mass molecule to have been hit, to have hit the quadrupoles and been wiped out. So high charge, heavy charge means heavier molecule. Lighter charge at the moment of impact means it must have been a lighter molecule. Now keep in mind, everything that runs through the quadrupoles, as I said, if it hits the quadrupoles, it stays there. It's not coming back. The quadrupole is a sealed area that cannot be opened. So if this material hits there, it's never coming back. Now over many, many years of use, the quadrupole can get a little gunked up. So as you're running analytes through the instrument, make sure you're running them at a relatively low molarity, within the micromolar to nanomolar range. The less molecules coming through this machine, the longer it can last. We know that this machine can pick up in the nanomolar to micromolar quantity, so let's keep it at that as we're working through the machine, just to prolong the life of the instrument. Once the analyte comes through the instrument and is observed, it will be displayed on the computer in this form here. This form shows the different ions that have come through the machine, with the x-axis representing the molecular weights and the y-axis representing the strength of the signal. So, now we have an idea of what masses are coming through the machine. We know that the mass spread, mass spec, the mass spectrometer, can analyze masses. How can we use this information? We combine this mass information with the data that we got out of the PDF. Let's pretend that we've just run an analysis. For our example, a compound diluted at, let's say, three minutes. Added as it diluted, it registered a lambda max at about mm, 282 nanometers. At the exact same time, the mass spec detected a reading, a spectral reading, at around 400 Daltons. Combining the spectral data, the mass spectral data, with the delta max data and the elution data, we can get an idea, we can determine what the compound was by checking literature or looking through mass spec and lambda max libraries. If you know what compound you're looking at because you've prepared it very purely and run it through the instrument, then in theory, PDA would be sufficient. But if you're not sure what your compound is, if you're running a mixture of, say, something you gathered from the Lackawanna River, well, then you would need the mass spec data. Now, this is a very powerful tool. You really only need, as I said before, in the micromolar to nanomolar quantities. And so, this wraps up our discussion on the theory of LCMS. In future videos, we'll be looking at how we use LCMS, how we apply some of these theories with our particular instrument here at Marywood University. Thanks again, and see you soon.